I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show. Today on The James Altucher Show. Ben Sheehan, who used to be one of the top writers at Funny or Die, he's written a book called WTF Does the Constitution Say? And... We talk about that, but the first thing I wanted to know from him is, is the world getting stupider when it comes to critical thinking? The nonstop dialogue on social media has taken a wrong turn, and just the general course of dialogue has declined. Everyone's gone from discussion to screaming. So the first thing I do is I ask Ben about this. I also ask him, because he made so many great videos and funny videos at Funny or Die, I asked him, how do you make a video viral? And so in part one, we talk about that. And in part two, we talk more about what the F does the Constitution say? Because you know what? It says a lot of things I didn't even know. So here goes part one. Part two is available today as well. Enjoy. So, Ben, so nice to meet you. I'm it's really, nice to meet you, too. You you have such a interesting background also. I, I love the Funny or Die stuff, and these Constitution books were great. Like, Jay and I even just did a, a few months ago, we did a podcast about the Constitution, and this fits perfectly. First, you were head of talent at Funny or Die. You wrote a lot of the video scripts, whatever. You got cast. You produced stuff. How does Funny or Die say so consistently funny? Like, it's like the funniest website out there. They have a really, really good ethos and track record of letting their employees um, run amok. And what I mean by that is there's very little creative oversight. There's this sort of this sort of mentality that honestly stems from Will Ferrell at the top. The idea is to try the weirdest thing and don't be afraid of failure and to just go for it. So I like that philosophy of try the weirdest thing, like thinking that way. Would you guys just sit around and say, well, what's the, like, would you look at the news and say, well, what's the weirdest thing we can do today? Yeah. I mean, part of that is trying to find the thing that would, you know, if it's something that you need to react really quickly to, if it's something topical, that's not going to be relevant in a couple of days, you got to have something ready to go that you could knock out that night or the next morning. Um, if it's something a little bit, you know, more of a long lead, you have, you have that freedom, but we always just tried to think, what is the thing that can be done here that can't be done somewhere else that isn't going to be on a late night show that isn't going to be on, um, some, you know, like that SNL is probably not going to do, what do we have the resources to make happen and, and the freedom to do, you know, not being bound by, uh, 
you know, standards. Um, well, to, what's an example? Because SNL has can do a lot, for instance, if that's your metric. Sure. So, I mean, the, 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 honestly, the, the Dennis Quaid example is a really good one, right? We, we basically filmed this entire video of Dennis Quaid having a full freak out on set, and he's responding to basically every all the swears he's saying, all the insults, everything, they make perfect sense on uh on set when you see the video so we recorded this this audio we leaked it there's no guarantee that that audio is going to go viral it's going to get picked up we figured that if we leaked it to enough sites and 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 put it out there and we actually used like redditors with high scores and profiles to to leak this audio so to make it even more legitimate that it's not some like brand new account leaking it so we we did all that and then it did get start to get picked up and then we had that video ready to go to show that this actually was a prank. Um, so, you know, because it's not like Funny or Die doesn't air at 1130 on a Saturday or doesn't have like a nightly show, we can kind of ride out, you know, the freedom of when that actually hits, we can drop it at, at any time. You know, um, that reminds me, um, there was this a video, it sounds similar, when Judd Apatow was filming Knocked Up, he took, um, he, he they they pretended as if Michael Sarah was the or, original person cast in the Seth Rogen role, and uh, they had they showed him freaking out on set, throwing things, yelling at Judd Apatow until he's finally fired from Knocked Up, and it's almost like they tried to do something similar. I don't know if you remember that video. I do remember that video. I I think there's there there have been a few times where people try to do you know. It, apparently, I think the lesson here is that the media is very easy to fool and and manipulate into sharing uh, audio clips and presenting them as real before they have the full information. And well, like I'm always curious, like what's if you were to let's say start making funny TikTok videos. I'm just hypothetically asking, what would you? How would you personally think about it? Like what what would be your kind of a process for coming up with a funny Instagram video or TikTok video, you know, using the same kind of methodology or ethos that you had for funny or die? Well, it depends how much budget I have, but if I had an unlimited budget, I think the slow reveal of things getting weirder and more chaotic is really fun. I think someone who does a great job on TikTok is Jack Black, where he'll like, it'll be just sort of be in a normal situation and suddenly, you know, a fire will light next to him and he'll turn around and there's this like, you know, centaur attacking him. It's just like, you have a, you have a, I mean, now you have a more than a minute, I believe for a lot of accounts, but you have a, a one minute to both get someone's attention in the beginning and then slowly keep their attention. And so an escalating series of chaos, uh, of chaotic events is a great way uh, to hold people's attention. And it's, again, it goes back to the whole thing of, you know, the, can I swear on this podcast? I don't yeah, know. yeah, of course. Yeah. It's like just, it, it, we, we called it the what, podcast. we only swear. We called it the what the fuck machine. We literally had like a sketch drawing of a machine called the what the fuck machine that was on the walls at Funny or Die. And it, I mean, it's just like silly contraption, but the whole idea is like, whatever your idea is, run it through that and get like the most weird, unique, strange thing, surprising thing out of it. And I think the one thing that was our guiding light there was always just try to surprise people. Um, the people like to share things for, for two reasons. Either they vehemently agree or disagree with it, so they want to share their opinion on something, or they, they can't believe something is happening. So the surprise factor is what we always tried to, to play into, something that was unexpected uh, that would kind of throw people because that seemed to have the, the best track record for generating buzz. You know, when you say the um, escalating the weirdness, it almost reminds me of uh, like the first few scenes of The Hangover, where first... Okay, like the Zach Galifianakis character seems a little weird. Uh, uh, the 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 groom's father-in-law seems a little bit weird. So okay, we're 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 it's got the setting for like a comedic movie, and then they wake up, and every of course you're noticing that something's off, and there's there there's a then he goes to the bathroom. There's a tiger in the bathroom, and it just gets weirder and weirder and weirder from there. And I thought The Hangover did it better than any other movie, that, that particular type of comedy. I, I think that's a perfect example. I think another example um, from the last couple of years is the movie Palm Springs. Uh, oh, I don't that know that one. Hulu. Oh, it's incredible. It's with, um, uh, it's an and Andy Samberg and Lonely Island did it. And oh it my is, God, it's, it's I gotta kind see of this. like, it's kind of, I, I, wanna, I don't want to mess up her name. I think the lead is Kristen Milioti. And it is this incredible um I don't want to give anything away, but it is sort of like it, the movie is just going along. It's sort of a normal romantic comedy pace. And then a few minutes in, 
something insane happens and it just it just grows from there and it is not at all what you expect. I, I love those movies where where something like there's just a total out of left field turn and it just kind of makes you question everything that you that you just saw. Um, other movies that are like that, Audition, which is a Japanese horror movie, uh, Good Morning Vietnam, uh, you know, where it's just like there's a tone shift in the middle and it's like a totally different movie from that point on. It's a really, it's a really fun kind of a bait and switch. Uh, I, I, I'm going to have to check all these out. I've seen Good Morning Vietnam, but uh, not the other two. And you know, it's funny about Andy Samberg. Like I love all the Lonely Island stuff and I feel like I never... I haven't seen, like, the best movie I've seen him in was Hot Rod. I thought that was very funny, but still not, like, hangover level. So I'm looking forward to seeing Palm Springs, if that's... Uh... I can't recommend it enough. It was my, I think it came out two years ago. It was my favorite movie of the year. Oh, wow. Okay, I have to see that. So, Constitution. Oh, my God. What the fuck does the Constitution actually say? A non-boring guide to how our democracy is supposed to work by you. And then you also have, of course, the companion book. What does the Constitution say? A kid's guide to how our democracy works. Why did you write about this stuff? Uh, fear. Um, uh, a, a deep uh, sense of uh, uh, social fabric falling apart. But I, I would say the more immediate reason is because when I was doing political work in 2018, um, I was educating people on the importance of midterm races, but not just not, not specifically races for Congress, races for for states. So like governor, secretary of state, attorney general. And so many people were coming up to me and asking me questions. And it was sort of like the situation where they'd like take me aside and do a one-on-one -on -one question because they didn't want to raise their hand because they didn't want to seem stupid in a crowd. And they would ask me, you know, why am I raising money for uh, the, you know, the secretary of state? Isn't he appoint or she appointed by the president? Why am I raising money for the attorney general? Isn't that, uh, you know, isn't that Jeff Sessions? And I would have to explain to them that their state also has a secretary of state and attorney general and that these are mostly elected positions and here's what they do. And this happened over and over that I started investigating civics. And that was sort of the aha moment where I realized that over the last 20 years, we've been cutting civics classes to the point where now only eight states require at least a year of civics or government at some point between kindergarten and 12th grade. So compared to previous generations, my generation, generations younger than me are getting way less civics education. And so that is sort of the the reason that I think a lot of these questions are unfamiliar to people. And so I wanted to create a book that was like me talking to a friend over drinks, not sort of like a stuffy professor talking down to somebody and just basically explaining the the foundations of how our country works through our founding documents. I think you're right. I think A, most people don't understand how, you know, what the constitution says how government actually works. You know, there were, when I was a kid, there were these cartoons, how a bill is passed, but obviously everybody for, has forgotten 40 years later what that cartoon said. And I think people don't have a clue. Uh, and, and I'm gonna ask some basic questions on this podcast here because I'm someone who I feel like I'm like into politics and I like reading about this stuff and I feel like I know a lot, but I was surprised by some things I read in the book. And I'm always surprised every time I, take a look at the constitution that a, it has stuff I didn't realize and B it has stuff. I feel we're not obeying on a regular basis. So, but first off, my, my first basic question is what happened between 1776 and 1791? Like, I feel like everybody says, Oh, the country began with the declaration of independence, but George Washington didn't start being president until like 1793. So what happened in those, what is it, 16 years? Were we just yeah. like at war for that long? And then well, there was the, the Articles <laughs> of Confederation, which disappeared. Like, they, like that, didn't we have a president of the Confederation? There's like a missing 16 years in our history. There's a, there, it, we do skip pretty immediately from uh, uh, the Declaration of Independence, which is just like, a, hey, here's an idea, oh, basically, is, is what that is. It's not a legal document. It doesn't have any legal force. It's just like, a, hey, we're deciding to do this. Um, and then obviously the Revolutionary War uh, transpired over the next several uh, years, seven, seven years or so. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's funny to me, like we celebrate the declaration of independence. We don't actually celebrate like winning the war. Like if we were to celebrate, that would be, um, uh, uh, you know, several years later, I think we'd be celebrating September 3rd, uh, uh, in the early 1780s rather than, you know, 1776. So we, we, we start, we celebrate, you know, this thing that before we even actually accomplished the task of becoming independent. I, um, I don't even know if it was like the early 1780s. Like when did, when did we give back? 
or when did we get back New York City from the the British? Well, the war was officially over in seven. I think it was September third, seventeen eighty three, was when they signed the Treaty of Paris, and that was like the official recognition. Okay, you guys are independent. But we did start the Articles of Confederation earlier, two years earlier than that, I believe, seventeen eighty one, and that lasted until the new Constitution took effect um, in in seventeen eighty nine. So we there is this weird gap of like. Yeah, we have the declaration. We said the ideas that we want to use to found the government. Then we had several years of war. Um, we also had uh, our first try at the Constitution that didn't work so well. And then we had this meeting to try to revise that, but it actually ended to the uh, ended up creating an entirely new document that is still in effect uh, uh, over two hundred uh, uh, years later. So what happened then? So the the war ends in seventeen eighty three, but we don't have a president of the United States till 1793, you know, elections in 1792. And then we, and then George Washington took office in March of 1793. So what happened in those 10 years? What were, what were we up to? Was it just chaos? Well, he took office in 1780, uh, uh, March, or I think it was April or May. It was a little bit delayed in 1789. Um, so his second term started in 1793. But we had a little bit of chaos, but we had this very loose agreement between these these colonies that were now states. And, and the Articles of Confederation was a very loose document that basically said, you know, we'll do the bare minimum to kind of, um, you know, protect the nation. Um, in order to change the Articles of Confederation, every state had to agree to a, uh, to a change, which never happens. And one of the things that led to this meeting that ended up creating a new constitution is something that happened in Massachusetts. And we may, we may know the term Shays Rebellion. I'm sure it's like name checked in all our history classes and we kind of breeze over it. But the real impetus is a lot darker uh, than I think I realized before I started writing these, these books. So in Massachusetts, you know, under the state government in Massachusetts, citizens were being taxed even more heavily than they were under the British. So this war was fought. And you that's know, kind of funny because in Massachusetts is where the, all the tax rebellion was. Right, exactly. And so it got to this point where, um, you know, in the, in the mid to uh, late 1780s, um, the citizens of Massachusetts were being taxed really, really heavily. And so there was a revolt and a number of um, Massachusetts residents took over a, a, a courthouse, um, I believe it was August of uh, 1786. And there were these series of protests, some of them violent. The most famous one, which was Shays' Rebellion in early 1787. And what happened was basically this group of citizens uh, had a standoff with a private army in Massachusetts, uh, uh, funded by a, a private donor. And what happened was you had an example of people who didn't want to pay a tax basically revolting and having success, um, you know, fighting the state government. And actually a number of those rebels ended up getting elected to the legislature. So, you know, to simplify this, you had a bunch of people who were at the bottom of the economic totem pole, and they basically, you know, found a way to get quickly to the top. And other states were really terrified because there wasn't a way for other states to come to like Massachusetts defense, they didn't have an obligation to help. And if that could happen in Massachusetts, that means that could happen somewhere else. Poor people could take over the, the state government. So that was what a lot of elites, quote unquote, feared. And so they had a, had a series of meetings to try to figure out how to stop Shays' Rebellion and others like it from happening in other states. And that's what led to this meeting of the Constitution. And that's why they created a more central government. So it was actually more about sort of, you know, stopping class uprisings than we, than a lot of us give it credit for. So, so if there was no class uprising, we'd still be the Confederation. Like what were the articles of the Confederation? What, and who, was there a president of the Confederation? Was there an army? I mean, like, there was, was a, there on? was a, there was a Congress. It was pretty, it was pretty loose and, and decentralized. So what the constitution did was create like a, a, you know, an official, um, you know, you have the U S army, you have the Navy, you have the, the militia, which is, which changed over time, but we, we made a much more centralized uh, government than we had under the Articles of Confederation. States had obligations to the federal government. They had obligations to each other in terms of respecting each other's laws and obviously, um, you know, federal taxes and, and stuff like that and how we elect representatives and basically creating a much more strong relationship between the states while still giving states autonomy. Um, but that sort of federal relationship didn't really exist under the Articles. And and who was the who was like in charge of the Confederation? Who was the president of the United the United Confederations uh, or states then? Um, well, again, it was more. It was a there was a Congress uh, where there was a certain number of representatives, and you could serve for different amounts of time. So there wasn't as I, I think there was one 
person who was like the the executive. I don't know as much about that person as I probably should, but it was more that Congress, you know, the Congress under the Articles of Confederation was what dictated what happened and, and sort of was the most powerful branch of the government, which oh, is yeah. honestly how our current constitution is supposed to operate. Um, it's, it's funny, I'm, I'm looking it up. I have never heard of this guy. So here I feel like I'm knowledgeable in history, but I challenge people to to name who actually the first president of the United States was after the war ended. This guy's name was John Hansen. I've never heard of him. There you go. So there was one executive, but he he didn't have as much power as the the current uh, role of president. And he was, again, largely um, at the whim of the, the Congress under the Articles. And to be honest, that is very similar to the relationship that's supposed to exist between the president and our current Congress. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra- I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy.
The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. Here's another question I have, which is, you know, and, and there are many articles in the Constitution which address this, but again, I think it's one of these things where people sort of know, but not really. What does the president of the United States actually do? Because in the Constitution, he doesn't really do a lot. No, he doesn't have that much power. In fact, the only thing he has the power to do, one of the very few things completely unchecked is to grant pardons and reprieves, so like lessen punishments or pardon uh, federal crimes. But there's really not a lot of independent autonomy that the president has free from, you know, oversight of, of Congress, or that's how it's supposed to, you know, supposed to work. The president is supposed to execute laws passed by Congress, like Full stop. That's that's the role of the office. You're also supposed to be the commander in chief of the the army and the the navy and the militia, which today is you know the U.S. National Guard and reserves. So you have this sort of active um, duty during wartime, and you are supposed to execute laws. You do have the power to veto laws, but Congress can override your veto with two thirds it votes in the chamber. So you really are you know and to 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 it sort of illustrate how this relationship was supposed to work for the first several months of the constitutional convention they had settled on the fact that congress was going to pick the president that was like mm -hmm. until until the end of the convention when they changed it and created the the electoral college the idea was well you know the the president you know similar to how it was the congress that was powerful under the articles the president should be beholden to congress so congress should pick the president but then they were worried that the president might you know sort of um it might affect the presidential veto, right? Because if the president is dependent on Congress and he just acts as like a rubber stamp for Congress, then Congress would, you know, pick that person again. So that's why they created uh, this this system with people who are not part of Congress and actually can't be part of Congress to, to pick the president. But it, it just underscores the whole point that Congress has always been the, the 
engine of our government. It's supposed to be the most powerful branch of our government. We don't have equal branches. This whole idea that we have three co-equal branches is a myth. I don't know where that that just sort of like got started one day yeah. and then Yeah, and then like continued. checks and balances is on every single test from second grade to 12th grade uh, that, that, oh, they're equal. They check each other. They balance each other. But it's just totally not true. And in well, fact, we'll talk about the Supreme Court in a second. Like their role in the Constitution was also after the Constitution. It wasn't in an amendment or anything. Well, I think it's important to draw a distinction between checks and balances and equal branches of power because those are not the same thing. You sure. can have okay. you can have three branches of government that check each other in different ways, but that doesn't mean they have equal power. So just because the president has the ability to veto a law, uh, a bill passed by Congress, that doesn't mean that the executive branch is equal in power because Congress can override that veto. Congress can impeach uh, the president, they can impeach um, uh, members of the Supreme Court. Those branches can't do the same to Congress. Like it's very clear, Congress is article one of the constitution. The constitution was originally written on four pieces of parchment. The first two are just about Congress. Article one is half of the constitution, the original constitution, the seven articles. So it is very clear that Congress was supposed to be the driver, but you can't have, you know, a, a, a driver of the government that is completely unchecked. So there are checks on Congress and the other branches, but that doesn't mean we have three co-equal branches of government. And, and you know, even the um, commander in chief of the army, the president is can't legally declare war on another country. He still needs Congress for that. And like, I, I think the last legally declared war was World War II. That's correct. Like yeah. Vietnam, Korea, uh, uh, Afghanistan, the Iraqs, like all of this were, I don't know how you call them. Like what's the constitutional authority the president has there to, to move military around? Well, the problem is that you have a Congress throughout the 20th century that has slowly delegated a lot of its power to the executive branch. And I understand in part, if you were to give Congress the benefit of the doubt, which is not something I want to make the habit of doing, but if you were to do that, you would say, okay, well, you need to react really quickly. And if you're trying to get, you know, Congress to constantly vote on everything, you know, if we're in the middle of a war or a Great Depression and we have to wait for this legislative body to deliberate, it may not move as quick as we need it. So if Congress is delegating certain tasks um, you know, uh, under a law that they've that they've passed, then you know it's the executive branch can theoretically execute faster. So, so there is sort of that's the benefit of the the doubt. But the problem is that if you are continually ceding your power and oversight to um, a branch that's largely made up of unelected people, you're going to run into issues. And so, look at all the wars like you just mentioned: you know, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Iraq War. These are all wars that were authorized by Congress, but Congress didn't use its constitutional power to declare war. And we have to get away from this weird habit of um, authorizing, uh, soft authorizing engagements without actually declaring them. It's, it's, a, it's a real area for concern. And, and so, okay, so the president basically can, I think that it also mentions he can throw parties, he can like entertain other world leaders. So that, I think that's a constitutional right of the president. And I don't know why that was, mentioned in the constitution, maybe because he can charge it to the government or whatever. You need a face guy, you know, you need somebody to go around and, you know, shake hands and, and welcome people. And so, you know, that's sort of like the, uh, the, the, the representative for the country is, is the president. He, he could pardon people and he can, um, and then these other things can be overwritten by Congress, which is, you know, treaties and vetoes, and he can be impeached. I'm just trying to think what else, like, why do we even need a president really? <laughs> Um, well, we do for the purpose of you need to carry out federal laws and you need to execute the things that are passed by Congress. That's why uh, we have this gigantic executive branch because these laws are very long. They're, th they're often thousands of pages. We're talking about, you know, a, a trillion dollar plus budget every year. And so somebody needs to spend this money uh, and, and carry out laws. But, you know, it, it is true that the executive branch, in my opinion, and I, I think I'll, I, if I were to guess, the founders would probably agree, um, I think has grown to a size that they would be pretty um, concerned with. And, right. and you have this sort of balance of power shifting as from the Constitution. It's supposed to be Congress leading the government. 
and then you have the president to execute the laws, and then you have the courts to decide you know, any disputes that arise. But even the power that we most associate with the Supreme Court today isn't actually in the Constitution, the ability to strike down laws if they think they're unconstitutional. The Supreme Court is the arbiter of whether or not a law is constitutional, um, you know, but they don't specifically have the power in the Constitution to strike down that law that came off of the court decision, uh, the famous Marbury versus Madison decision in 1803, where the Supreme Court just decided it had that power. And we've all been going along with it and just uh, taking their word for it for over 200 years. So. Um, there's a lot that I think is is almost directly at odds with our constitution, whereas today we think of our government, and I think a lot of us would say the power is centered with the president and the Supreme Court. If you're just basing it off of how often these branches of government are discussed in our media, how often um, we we adhere to them and, and sort of ascribe this power to them, but it's actually the complete opposite if you look at the constitution. Right, so... so what was the reason for the amendments? Why did they include at least those first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, in the articles for the Constitution? Why did they make them uh, amendments to the Constitution? So there was a lot of debate. You know, you need, at the time, you needed um, 13, or sorry, nine states to ratify the Constitution for it to take effect. So nine out of 13 states. And there were a lot of states that had issues with the Constitution. They were afraid that it was centralizing too much power. You know, they created this country um, in direct response to uh, a, a monarch, a, un- a, a single person, being able to pass down uh, their power through their bloodline to be uh, the person who can say what the law is. And they wanted to have the opposite of that. So they wanted to get away. They were very worried about a too centrally strong government. So what happened is James Madison, um, in exchange for the remaining states to get to nine uh, to ratify the Constitution and the states after that too, um, he promised to craft amendments that would protect individual freedoms from the federal government. So it was sort of done like, I promise I'm going to do this if you, uh, you know, if you guys help you know, to, to ratify the Constitution and then also continue to vote for it as new states emerge. So we're talking about 10 amendments. It actually began as 19. Uh, and then they got whittled down to uh, 17 and then 12, and then 10 ended up getting ratified, and that became the, the Bill of Rights. So it was sort oh, of- Oh, I didn't know that. Well, what were some of the missing nine? <laughs> well, what's funny is that there were um, uh, a number of, uh, actually one amendment that was part of the original Bill of Rights that that was not, that didn't make it in. It was part of the two that were not ratified by the states, actually became the 27th Amendment. So it was, and that's a whole story behind that. Um, but basically, it basically it says that Congress can't give itself a pay raise and until an election has transpired in between. So like, you can't have Congress vote today to give themselves a pay raise. It takes effect tomorrow. There has to actually take effect uh, after the next congressional election. And that law, that that amendment didn't exist until 1992. But it was part of the original Bill of Rights that was proposed by Congress to the states. That's so funny. So basically, they could just vote themselves a pay raise and they would get it instantly. Uh, until 1992, that's correct. That's funny. Um, and what do you know of any other that were in the missing nine, like some rights that we don't have right now? Um, oh, oh, and then I have another question right after that about one of the rights. Sure. Well, a couple, a couple of them. Uh, the the language of one of the amend, some of the amendments that didn't get ratified ended up making it into the Fourteenth Amendment and also the uh, the Fifth Amendment around due process and, and um, sort of equal protection of the laws. But another one is just like talking about the size of Congress. And this is moot today because it's like when the population gets to a certain size, we're going to have 200 representatives in the House. When it gets to a certain you know size, they're going to represent more people. Um, but this all went haywire in 1929 because we decided to cap the number of representatives in the House at 435. And so we've been growing the population, obviously, ever since, but the House has not been keeping up with the population. So, you know, in the Constitution, originally it was 30,000 people for every representative in the House. Today, it's, uh, I think, 782,000 people for every representative in the House, which is more than 20 times uh, the original intent. So yeah, I guess, there's a lot, I guess, there's a lot, it's a lot harder to represent the interests of 782,000 people um, uh, in a body of, of government than it is the interests of, of 30,000. Right. There would probably be, there would probably be 10,000 congressmen if right now with the population. Well, the you'd have over 11,000 people in the House. That's correct. Yeah. That's, that's funny. So, okay. So Congress in the articles, Congress has the power to collect taxes. But in 1913, there was an amendment that we're going to collect taxes. So 
what, did they kind of foresee they were going to eventually have an amendment that would collect taxes or what happened with the taxes? So yeah, I mean, we didn't have income tax until the uh, the Sixteenth Amendment, and uh, which is what you're you're referring to. Um, and we had basically people pay a tax per head. Um, when the Constitution was written, it was states paid their federal tax based on their population. So like a you know a uniform tax, like forty bucks a person or whatever it is. And this is actually called a poll tax. We often associate poll taxes with voting, but a poll tax just means like a tax per head. And today we kind of do a similar thing. Like if you get a driver's license, you have to pay a fee to the the government. Like, you know, everyone has to pay the same fee. It doesn't matter how rich or poor you are or what your income is. Um, You know, a driver's license costs this amount of money or a passport fee or whatever it is. But this is how we used to pay taxes until we tied it to income. And then it allowed the Congress to collect a lot more money because before that, you had people who were paying very little uh, in in tax and their wealth was growing astronomically and so it was kind of a response to rein in the uh, the growth uh, of the turn of the century. Well, that worked really well. So, <laughs> and it's uh, not like we see any echoes of that today with uh, you know skyrocketing inequality. So it's clearly had an effect. Right. Uh, what surprised you in the Constitution when you were writing this? There's a, there's a bunch of things that surprised me, but I'm curious. Like, what did you learn? I would say the biggest, I would say two things. One is I was really surprised to find out that we don't have a right to vote in this country. We have voting rights protections, but those are not the same thing as an actual proactive right to vote. Uh, The 15th Amendment, uh, the 19th Amendment, and the 26th Amendment, which talk about voting rights protections for people based on their race, based on their sex, and based on their age being 18 plus, that's not the same as a proactive grant for the right to vote. The right to vote has always been up to the states. And again, the reason being is that if you had said specifically who can and can't vote when the Constitution was written, some states would have had a problem with that. So like in you know 1787, the population of the southern slaveholding states was relatively equal in population to the northern non-slaveholding states. The difference is that far fewer people in the South could vote because a lot of them were enslaved and they didn't have the ability to vote in their state. So even though you had equal numbers, um, you didn't have equal numbers of voters. And so that's why you ended up getting um, the three-fifths compromise and that is the basis for the electoral college in part. But it really surprised me that we don't fundamentally have a right to vote and that our voting rights are not enshrined in the Constitution, although certain protections are. Well, who can't vote? Well, I mean, prisoners, right? People who are yeah. people who are incarcerated in, in all states but two. So except for Maine and Vermont, there are at least some limitations on your ability to vote if you've, you know, committed a crime. In Maine and Vermont, even if you are sitting in prison, you can still vote. You can still fill out a ballot. You never lose your voting rights based on incarceration. Some states, you lose it when you're in prison. Some states, you lo- you or you or lose it when you're in prison and while you're on probation or parole. Like there are di- Different states have their own laws about when you get your voting rights back. And some states never give them back. Um, you know, that was what Florida voted on in 2018, the, the constitutional amendment, state constitutional amendment to give voting rights back to uh, former felons. And it's gotten delayed in court. And then there was a state, state legislature passed a law saying, you know, you have to pay back all your fines before you get, um, you know, your, your right to vote back. And so it's just been this long, this long battle. But that's, that's I'd say, one very clear, obvious um, uh, uh, discrepancy between states on who can and can't vote. And, and I, I could see the point where basically if you abuse your rights of living in this country, say by committing a federal crime, maybe you shouldn't vote. I, I don't know. I could see both sides of that. On the other hand, if, you're, if you abuse your rights because you're a political dissident of some sort, then maybe you shouldn't lose the right to vote. So I could see both sides of allowing prisoners to vote or not allowing them to vote. But essentially, that we have... I, I would argue we don't have as many political prisoners as other countries and percentage wise. And so maybe it's a good thing to, if you're in prison to not vote, but I don't know. Well, I would say that you have to look at what historically it, felony disenfranchisement has been used to do. And if you look at this very small wording in the 14th amendment, we often think of 14th amendment for like section one, right? Equal protection of, uh, of the laws and birthright citizenship and stuff like that. But, Section two talks about what happens if states don't let men who are 21 and over and, you know, have, having committed a crime, um, they don't let them vote, then they get penalized with less 
representatives in, in the House. But the very key word is or other crime. So it basically says you're not going to get penalized if you um, deny voting rights to men who are 21 and over, residents of the state, um, citizens, um, if they've committed a crime. So basically, getting somebody a felony in the Constitution, somebody with a felony disenfranchise, someone who's committed a felony um, can be denied um, you know, the right to vote without repercussion. And so what happened is you started seeing states pass a lot of laws that seemed to be pretty questionable laws, things like uh, uh, loitering or uh, vagrancy laws or having to show proof of employment when asked if you couldn't produce it quick enough. You could be detained and then sent back to work on the plantation you just left a couple years earlier. And these were called the Black Codes. These were a series of laws after the Civil War ended um, that were used to disenfranchise people. And that tradition has unfortunately continued. I mean, look at uh, the discrepancy in sentencing in the in the 80s and 90s around uh, cocaine laws, crack cocaine versus powder cocaine. I mean, this is a long, ugly tradition of using laws uh, to disenfranchise certain groups of voters. So yeah, like didn't even in the 13th Amendment, you know, which you know, supposedly freed the slaves, wasn't there a carve out unless you were uh, in jail? Yeah, unless, unless you, you know, yeah, unless you, it, it could still be used as punishment for a crime. So if you committed a crime, you could be made to, you know, to, to work for no money, which we still do in several states. I mean, in, in most states, the wage, wages for, for labor are, are less than a dollar still. Uh, some states uh, don't even pay any money. I believe Texas pays not a, not a single a cent for, for prison labor. So, you know, you could pass a state law that's a questionable law, lock somebody up for breaking it and make them do, you know, unpaid labor for as long as their sentence is. I would argue that seems pretty similar to slavery and even similar to the, the black codes that happened in the, the late 1860s. Right. And in fact, I think it was even for many decades, it was even called like neo-slavery, like a new form of slavery that was defined by the 13th Amendment. Why didn't anybody address this ever? <laughs> I, well, the sad thing is that... Because, like, black people were put in jail quite a bit in the late 1800s for, for like you said, for almost no reason, essentially putting them back into slavery. Right. Well, the, well the, 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 those, those were made illegal. Um, the, the federal government made those. Uh, the black codes were, you, you couldn't do that anymore. And so a lot of those laws were unconstitutional, were, were deemed illegal, um, illegal state laws, um, and that's part of what the, the 14th Amendment tried to try to do. Equal protection of, of the laws was meant to fight against things like the, the Black Codes and these sort of unfair laws when if you enforce them, it's very clearly disenfranchising a specific group of people, African Americans at the time. So there definitely has been a, a response since then uh, and an opposition to such laws. But, you know, I think... You know, without oversimplifying it, racism is very good at hiding. It's very good at adapting, and it's very good at finding you know its its way into more granular administrative things where you have laws today around who can and can't vote or what kind of proof of ID you need to be able to vote or or how states um, allow people to register online or 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 vote by mail and stuff like that. They all the policies sound completely fair and neutral on their surface, but if you look at the groups of people that are affected, they are very disproportionately affecting people of color, low income people, um, and I think that just carries it continues this very ugly tradition that was started, you know, in the in the wake of the Civil War. So in part two, we talk more about what the F does the Constitution say. If you like these episodes, please share them. Particularly the Constitution one is so important for how we understand the country of the U.S. and many other countries because they, the Constitution has become the boilerplate for the constitutions of many other countries as well. So uh, uh, enjoy. Stay tuned for part two. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home.